Hey everyone, welcome back to the arena. I'm MD, joined here by Kobe, and once again, an awesome guest that we can't wait to have a conversation with. Uh, first and foremost, love and appreciation to those who continue to follow us and show support. What's going on, guys? We have an awesome guest here. Her name is Stella McMillan. I uh, met and saw Stella at the gym, which I feel like I've probably had five people now that I've met at Mode. So shout out Mode for just bringing in an awesome community of people. Um, but Stella is a first generation immigrant. Um, she was she got an athletic scholarship. If I'm misspeaking, please tell me. Uh, for wheelchair basketball at U of I. So we got three U of I grads here. Go Illini. Was a first team All American and now is a current law student at UIC. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, Stella, why don't you just provide a background for listeners? Kind of like who is Stella and yeah. how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, a little background. So I, uh, I'm originally born in Bakken, Vietnam, which is a province in North Vietnam. Um, I'm, I was abandoned at birth. I was a, I'm a congenital bilateral amputee, meaning I was born without legs. But you know, I like to spice it up, say like a shark accent or something. Like <laughs> I was just born like it. It's like oh, that's not fun. Uh, but yeah, and then I grew up in the orphanage for about five years of my life, and so uh, definitely different. Uh, environment definitely like electricity you know morning water totally different i guess now it's not pc to say with our boy country but that type um so definitely humble beginnings and then i was adopted and i grew up in chicago not the suburbs in chicago um and then i went to curie high school for high, um, high school and then i went to u of i um during high school i made it onto team junior team usa i was on a wheelchair track I went to the world championships, had two silver medals in the track, and then... Gotta get you a goal. Yeah, I know. I said then, that's, that's why I'm thinking about 2028 LA, but um, then I decided, oh, I'm just going to focus on school, and then U of I offered me a full ride, and I was like, shit, I can't, I can't, I can't turn that down. So I decided to do that, and so I played wheelchair basketball and wheelchair track at the same time. I don't know why. And then also the work part-time as well and so that was my uh, really busy schedule and then yeah for, we got third place in nationals for the women's wheelchair basketball my coach was the, was the only coach ever able-bodied or adaptive sports to ever be a player and be a coach and win gold both times uh, so she's won gold in Athens and Beijing then she won gold as a coach for London and Rio she retired as a USA coach she won, on, on a gold you know that's a good time to retire yeah. Um, and so yeah, just and U of I has a lot of like history for adaptive sports. We um, back in Tim New Gen, he um, after World War Two, he wanted veterans to go to get get education. So it's the first public university to be all accessible, like wheelchair accessible, like the curbs and everything. Um, so it's very privileged to do that. And then in 2017, 2018, U of I was named the official Paralympic Training Center for wheelchair track. Um, and so Paralympic is not the same as Special Olympics. People get a little confused. Special Olympics is mental uh, impairments. Uh, sp uh, Paralympics is supposed to be parallel to the Olympics. So it's the same competitive, same degree, same height, and all that. So definitely, uh, that's a little bit about me. So how old are you when you're adopted? I was five. So you were five. So what was life like years zero through five, uh, you know, from what you can remember? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you had my uh, adoption picture. I had short hair because the bugs were like eating my hair, and so I, and then uh, no one picked me up as a baby, so like the back of my head is flat, it, like kind of scald. I was shaved, I shaved my head first grade, but um, and so definitely just crying a lot, sad, like um, and that's why I'm just vaguely, I vaguely remember those things and like adoption pictures. I was like, oh yeah, you looked a little rough there, girl. Um, but yeah, so definitely, I think uh, no. It, and especially when it's, and I'm getting into the legal field, like everyone, like different type of world, like different, I guess, first world problems. It's like, I bring in my humble experience and like, no matter what, it's don't forget where I came from. And my middle name is Nin T. Vu. And so T. Vu is what they call me in the orphanage. And I'm from Bak Nin, the province. So I won't forget, that's my middle name. So I won't forget where I came from. So I talk a lot of shit, but I'm very actually a humble person. Yeah. Um, and then like, maybe talk a little bit about just like the the identity that comes with yes um you know mm -hmm. like not having legs and like yeah. what people like feeling bad or, or like how have you kind of like navigated that maybe talk about some of the highs and lows yeah. of kind of working through that because even like 
our conversation mm -hmm. for people that didn't get a part of it like I, I yesterday I asked if we could do it remote because I didn't realize that we had a bunch of stairs and I didn't want to yes. make it like difficult mm -hmm. and then I was quickly enlightened that you were more than capable yeah. of doing it so just like yeah. how do you kind of navigate that um, identity I guess it's a twofold because I'm also adopted so also identity of who I am I think for the longest time I put my identity with sports um, I was like oh yeah this is and then because of the um, but before even that I was the only person in my community that I knew that I was disabled so I used to have prosthetics because I wanted to blend in as much as possible I didn't want to uh, be you know the outlier so I had prosthetics and they range from like looking like real legs to you know Terminator like I've seen gold like there was a lady on a, a podcast that I listened to that lost one of her legs like in a traumatic mm -hmm. experience and she has like gold probably oh, like wow. all gold prosthetic legs I had titanium kind of like gold <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like very yeah, yeah they're like top top and so yeah I always used to try to blend in but then in the winter time at my crutches I would always slip on the ice and mm -hmm. or they would break and I feel like I wasn't as fast enough like if I had to carry something and so then I, I discovered adaptive sports which is like recreational which is sports for people with physical disability uh, and it, it just opened up a whole like, eyesight because I, I was kind of like, uh, that's not me. Like, ew, like, I'm not disabled kind of like, kind of mentality. And then I guess the stigma. And then I was like, oh, wow, there's, there's a whole community. There was, I went to a summer camp and it was like 50, 60 kids with all different ranges of disabilities, but physical disabilities. But we kind of had the understanding of like the commonality of like we understand this this type of struggles will, I mean, yours might be different than mine, but like similar struggles and it was a sense of community, sense of, and I fell in love with it. I discovered myself, like um, self-independence, sense of, like my self-confidence, but then I kind of like dove into it and I was like, this is who I am. And then I think during COVID, it was like, ooh, who are you, Stella? I was like, that's a good question. Um, and What's the answer? Uh, so I, I am part of, like, I think, because I always, because also being abandoned uh, and not knowing my family, my biological family, it's like, oh, you know, like nature versus nurture. Uh, but I am who I, I describe myself, I would be is uh, intentional. I am charismatic and I'm also just a uh, big hearted person. I think that that's the, the words I would describe myself. You mentioned like relating to other people's struggles, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, coming from. The, the place in Vietnam to mm -hmm. coming here in Chicago, yeah. uh, the physical challenges. When you are like in school growing up mm -hmm. and you're around other people, um, maybe of more privileged backgrounds, yeah. and you hear them complaining about yeah. what you would probably call spilled milk, like what's that like for you just maybe being more observant or mm -hmm. were you outspoken about that in the classrooms or in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the group settings or were you just more of like, Looking at that and being like, how can you how can you complain about that? Yeah. I mean, at what point did you like develop a sense of like, okay, well, problems are relative, but yeah. you know, you can't compare in yeah. some ways. Um, at what well, first? Uh, first of all, middle school middle school kids are ruthless, but um, I, I think that when I I think initially I used to be like, why do you guys complain like that makes? But then I think to the point, I think in middle school I realized you. You can't blame for the people, the uh, the kids, or the families that they're born into, and if they're born into, and they all the privilege they have, like ignorance, right? Like as as in start, right? And now they continue to be ignorant. That's different. But if they are ignorant, that's because of the privileges. Like I can't be mad at that because it, they truly don't know, and especially in middle school, it's like it's not like that. Which is, I feel like, kind of our situation. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I, I just I, yeah. I haven't been privy to. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then I have friends who tell me I never realized places are not accessible until I became your friend, Stella. And then mm -hmm. now, and, the, and like you know, now you have friends, and then you're like, oh, where are we gonna go eat? If it's stairs, it's like, oh, you know. Uh, but I, I like, and I totally understand. Like, I'm not mad like that. I think it's just a things when they when they're intentional so like an example like i this past time i worked at a law firm and they were like oh we're going on an architecture boat tour i said 20 times and even day orientation day there's only one dock that is accessible just want to let you know it's if you go by like the apple stores or right across the street like on the river that's the only one that's actually accessible with the elevator don't worry stella we got it okay so that's the point where you are alert and i tell you and then 
if it doesn't work out, then it's like, oh, come on, guys. So then I could be mad. But if, if you don't know at first, like, I can't be mad at you for that. So then, like, was there ever, like, challenge with your mental health growing up or with, with the other challenges that you had? Or was this, like, not all of my focus is on the physical. My mental is actually a strength for me. No. Yeah, there was definitely a challenge. Because people say, well, your brain is a muscle, but I've never, worked like, worked it. And so for a while... Um, I think, and then my family has, uh, when I say my family, my doctor family, but my family has a lot of struggles with a lot of, you know, mental illness as well. And so I feel like I had to be the strong one. Like I was always known as the happy one. And then the, like, the one that got, you know, just, you know, where people in the street, like you're such an inspiration. And so like, I always, I was like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Until it was like, oh wait, you're not fine. Right. And then. Um, when was that moment for you? Like the oh shit, I'm actually not fine. Was it? Can you like pinpoint uh, it, or is it just yeah. kind of like a? No, I th and it was like a, I think fifth, sixth grade or something. Like, and then plus like I my normal child, I didn't have one. Like I was I was a Comcast Sports like internet um, inspiration athlete of the year. I got got to drop the puck to the Blackhawks. I got to throw the first pitch out. So like at a very young age and so I was in newspapers I was because in, in high school I was a 10 times state champion and so like it was a lot and then I think um and then like breakfast with Whippy Gold but just like things I, like, I, I can't even like like plan out if I wanted to so you, then, had, you had breakfast with Whoopi? yes well, that's yeah. pretty cool yeah so just <laughs> Just I life, like what? I was like, all oh, that, and that's what you caught. <laughs> yeah, that's the first puck, and that's dropping the puck. Oh, well, it's you know. just such a yeah. unique, like, yeah. breakfast with Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, yeah. that's pretty and, cool. And so, um, <laughs> and so I think it hit me around like sixth or seventh grade. I was like, because uh, my mother suffered from severe mental illness, and so then I realized, I'm like, oh, wait, your mother's like, goes to see, like, is active in your life? I was like, that's like, because. I, I, you know, I didn't know that was, like, other people's normal, so I was like, oh, because I thought that was just, and so, yeah, I tried, to, I tried to take my life when I was in sixth grade, and then, um, I was like, oh, like, you're not okay, and then, um, but yeah, so, didn't work out, so we're here, so, um, but yeah, so definitely, um, I realized I need to, like, talk to somebody or something, so everyone should go to therapy. Yeah, I fully a proponent of therapy. So, Can you, um... Maybe just talk about what it's like to experience like suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. ideation. We've had a couple guests yeah. on the show that have experienced directly. We've also had a lot of, too many of our guests have experienced um, loss, yes. like a, of a loved one to suicide. Yes. Yes. And so I just love any chance we have to talk mm -hmm. about yeah. uh, just what it's like and like how you know other people can be supportive. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think people don't realize how much people care about you. Like, I think you, and then, but also people don't know when you need help if you don't ever ask for it. And so, like, in my, like, for me, I just feel like I, I'm, I'm surrounded by all these people, but I still feel so alone. And it was like, you know, in a room full of people and I'm, I'm doing all these accolades, but like, who's really there for me? But then also no one knew to be there for me. I never spoke about it. Um, and so I think that was, that was kind of the problem was like, oh, no one really cares when you're down. Well, no one knows when you are down and like I think there's power in vulnerability but I think being in sports and you have to be like the alpha and all this like to be vulnerable be like I'm not okay it's like whoa like we don't really especially like in adaptive sports I feel like you know you've overcome this already like what, what now you're complaining about this like come on and then also I think guilt right because like how am I sad right now when you know I came from the orphanage and you have like people what people dream about like you don't you don't have time to be sad kind of thing. So what was it, what was it that you were struggling with? Um, like what I guess what were the causes of your rock bottom? Uh, causes I think it was a combination, but also just like uh, watching my mother be suicidal, and then it was like damn, and like not feeling the value right. It's like you know like not seeing her, any reason for her to live when I'm right here. And so it was like, damn, like, there's no point in my value then. Because, like, I think, like, the people closest to you who you value, like, if someone on the street, like, the, the stream, like, the city girl me is like, someone on the street was like, hey, you ain't shit. I'm like, I, I don't give a fuck about you. But, like, if somebody, like, someone very close to you said it, it's like, damn, you know. And so I think I base my value on others. And, like, it's hard, especially, like, as family and at a, at a young age, like, you're basing that off of you. 
your parents or your relatives like and it, it took a very long time for me to base that on myself and not just the results of sports and not the results of other people but I really based that on a lot of folks. Do you have um, any brothers and sisters? I do. Uh, yeah. Not biological but like no, you're, adopted. Yes. You're, and are they also adopted? Yes. Okay because I was curious yes. if just that whole dynamic of um, being adopted, what it's mm -hmm. like in terms of family, yeah. if there was in the case where like they had, there was also a biological, like an mm -hmm. actual biological yeah. um, sibling, mm -hmm. like are they treated differently than you, yeah. just like that whole yeah. dynamic, maybe just speak to yeah. generally what So, uh, my grandmother had two kids of her own, and then she adopted a South Korean, my uncle, and he's married to African American, my aunt. And then my grandmother adopted a Vietnamese, but South Vietnam, and so I'm from North. People are like, ah, oh. which is so. And then my grandmother, her husband was in the Vietnam War, but for the American side, which is so so ironic. I come from the North. And then my mother adopted my sister. She's Mexican. She's from California. She has a skin disorder uh, called ichthyosis. And then um, my brother, who is autistic, and then me. Well, my brother first, then my sister, then me. But like she has a, my, you know, the grass is never always green on the other side. Like my sister has an open adoption. She knows who her mother is. She just has no interest in reaching out. And it's me on the other hand, it's like, I would love to like, not like, you know, like be best friends with my biological family, but like just see, you know, nature versus nurture, you know, not only physical characteristics, but sometimes attributes that you can't, you know, can't describe in your DNA. Did that, did that factor into <clears throat> your uh, depression or your feelings of lowness in growing up, like feeling like, okay, well, I don't feel valued here in certain ways, but there's still these other people out there that are my biological parents that I have a longing or a desire to at least meet or, or know so that you can maybe feel that value in a different light. Um, I mean, like, my again, adoption is always very balancing because, like, my uncle one time was like, just turned around and was like, you're, you, like, I don't owe you anything, right? Uh, to my grandmother and like, to adopt someone and love them as your own and then to have them turn around and be like, you're not my mom. And it's like, damn. Versus me, I have always like, I just say my mom, my dad. Like, I've seen them as my, like, that's my family. Mm -hmm. Family doesn't mean blood. But I think, um, I think it was like, sometimes like, just the characteristics like, that would just like, I would sit there and like, uh, like, you guys don't have it so then it, it, like in my humor sometimes it's like where do I get it from or like sometimes I would just feel like the odd one out uh, which is ironic because like my sister's also adopted but like she has similar characteristics as my mother uh, so I always felt like sometimes the odd one out but I don't, I don't think it was like that I was like singled out but because they always loved me like my like like their own so I think it was just myself getting myself in my head convincing myself what you mentioned you love to give a chance to speak uh, to your biological family, yeah. what would you say to them? What, like, what conversation would you like to have? Um, just a why, you know? Um, you know, because I know, like, Southeast Asian culture, kind of where, you know, taboo, where if you, e even if you have flat foot asthma, like, someone in your past life did something bad or something, or some, like, you know, it, was it that, or is it just, like, because, or you just did it, you know, because, like, do I have siblings? So you could, yeah, or do I have younger siblings? So you decide to keep the younger siblings, but not me. You know, just the why part, and that's it. Like, and do they ever think about me? Is, is there any sense of like, do you want? Are you looking for? I could be totally wrong, but are you looking for like closure? Is there a sense I of? I guess, yeah. I, I people call it, yeah. It, you know, just the, just the why, and like, do they ever think you know about me? Because like, um. I guess that part, but like not. I don't plan to be like besties or anything. Just like, or even if I could just see them, right? Because like, I also don't look like the most like, like when I tell people I'm Vietnamese, they're like, no, you're not. I'm like, well, I'm seventy percent according to twenty three and me. But um, people are like that's you know, and then like, or people are like, oh, what's your what's your rising? I have no clue. I don't know what time I was born. Or you know, do you look more like your mom or your dad? I have no clue. I can't tell you. So like things like. You know, um, but just the why, mostly the why, and like do everything about me. I am close with the lady who runs the orphanage, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned in part of your story, like a sense of feeling alone as part of, like you had all these people around you, yet you felt like yeah. super um, just lonely. Yeah. Uh, like, what do you think, or what ultimately, like, 
led to you feeling seen or heard? And if it never happened, like, what do you think would have made uh, you f feel that sense of like actual community and a sense of feeling like a, a part of mm -hmm. and being heard? Yeah. So I, um, I think like I, I started feeling heard when like someone else was brave enough to be like, "Yo, I'm not okay." I'm like, "Oh my gosh, you're not a baby either." And so like not feeling like oh i'm not the only one um but and so then uh talking about you know and i think society now is becoming more encouraging about either like journaling reflecting meditating going to therapy anything that helps with like you know even if you need to write it down and just burn it or never see it again or delete it like to release that um you know things that you're carrying that you don't know that you're carrying and you, know, you accumulate in life um I read a book that changed my life, The Things That You Can Only See When You Slow Down. It was written by like a, a, a Buddhist, I believe, in some like 50 something languages. And in the little first page, like, this is not the type of book you're supposed to rush through. It's kind of like life. Like, you're supposed kind to, of ironic? Yes. Like, supposed to slow down when you read it? Yes, yeah, I know, right? And so, <laughs> and there's pages where like, there's no picture, there's nothing. And it's like, you're supposed to think about it. But yeah, there was like one analogy where it was like, it's kind of like dumbbells, right? And you're carrying, you know, eventually, like, in life, you're like 70. You're probably only carrying like 25 or 10 pounds. Like, you're always going to carry something, but, like, it's not as, as a heavy load. But you have to acknowledge that. And, so, and why was it transformative for you? Because, um, you know, I think it was, um, again, fast life. All, all these sports, like, I played so many sports. And... I, like I played wheelchair basketball, uh, wheelchair softball, and like I was also like sled hockey and all this, and um, I think that it was go 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 that like and then also you have to be content with yourself. So I was never confronting my own thoughts, but then slowing down, it's like oh, and then reading about it when I read it, I was like wow. So like really transformed in my so, opinion. So did sports and the attention that you were getting from being an athlete yeah. and being a high caliber athlete, did that fill a void of validation for you where maybe you weren't getting that external validation elsewhere? And like, did that help as like maybe like a, a crutch, but then did that also take you away from you truly loving yourself? And did you kind of fall into a trap of like feeding into all of that external validation? I think both, yeah. Like you said, yeah, you said it pretty well. It's like, I think I was doing a lot of sports to get validation, not from the outside public, but from just my parents. Mm -hmm. so again, my mother was suffering mental illness, and like, if she didn't see the value in me, I thought maybe if I get all these accolades, maybe she'll understand the value. Um, and so, wow. uh, so that's what I was doing it. And then, but then I, sports did help me in the ways of like, like I said, self confidence, self independence, how to advocate for myself, and how to, um, you know, when if. Not, not just like advocating like oh like can you open the door for like things I'm like well that's not right like you know let's talk about it um so I think it, it helped in the balance but like there was a point again where I needed to stop putting my value in others but it you know who are you you know you can't take all these accolades with you when you die like well, who are you and so folks yeah you mentioned therapy you put it out there as a yes, big proponent of it you're saying yes, sir. So I know I know how you feel about it, but maybe yeah. just talk about then you know your experience with therapy, what it's mm -hmm. taught you about yourself, how it's kind of helped you walk, just live life, yeah. etc. Uh, you yeah. get therapy is very. I think that uh, a friend is a great. Yes, you can vent to your friend, but there's something about talk like I when you say it out loud. Like if someone like that, like for me, if, I, if someone dies and I don't like tell people. Okay, it's, it, it, technically in my head, it, it didn't happen, right? But once I say it out loud, that, like someone died, you, you, your brain has to like register like, oh, like this is, like it actually came true. And so when your feelings are like, you don't have to say it out loud or like, I, I, or write it down, like you don't have to confront your thoughts. So I think the moment when you say it out loud and have that courage to tell someone, and especially a stranger, technically with a therapist or whatever, it's different. It's, it's a whole different, and it's kind of like therapeutic or, whatever people I think it's important because um you're like oh I'm fine I think in daily life you just on the like you know go through your basic routine that you don't realize what you are what you're confronting or you're suppressing and I've had my tendency is to just suppress 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 until it overflows and then like I might like snap on someone who was like well, like that didn't deserve it but then I don't I'm not confronting what I'm actually going through 
So yeah, I did all through undergrad, through it now, especially in the legal field, orientation day, they said the legal field, highest depression, highest alcohol, highest the suicide rate, welcome to law school. And I was like, great. <laughs> and so there's a, there's a program they offer, it's free for all law students and attorneys for life. It's a program, LAD, LAD, L-A-D-P, uh, it's, I think, um, provides just counseling because they know the high stress of that field. Do they, do they give any statistics around how many people actually use it? Oh, I don't know. I'm just it's curious. on the website. It's on the website, definitely, because these are past attorneys who who are now therapists, and so I think you also have a better understanding. It's like it's not just a exam. Like this is like you know the pressure of it, and then especially my one year, uh, my first year. Sorry, my both my grandparents passed away in between my finals, each final. So in the fall, between my property and tours, my grandmother passed away. And then in the spring semester, I would drive to the hospital, visit my grandfather, and then go study for the final. And then he died right after my final. So uh, law school is just stressful in general. Uh, and so, uh, but the, that on top, yeah, I was ready to say fuck law school. I was not sorry, to me cuss, but I mean, okay. Uh, but yeah, I was ready, like, absolutely. Because I was crying, but then I was like not, I was mad at myself because I wasn't studying. But then I was like, I'm not mourning at the same time. So it was just a lot. And so how have you been able to manage like just that stress, but also just like the daily stress that comes with being in mm -hmm. law school? Do you have any, have you learned any either therapy or just more generally like uh, tools that have worked for you to kind of like ground mm -hmm. yourself? Um... Or are you just like, I'm just going to be stressed, I accept it, but I, how do you be kind of dealt with that? Yeah, I, I, um, I compartmentalize a lot, so I know I have a lot of to-do lists, but also I give myself grace, whereas if I don't finish it, that's okay. Like, there will be another day, and that's, I don't know, that's what tomorrow's for. So, obviously, like, there's a schedule and regimen, it's important, but like, also, uh, but also, perspective, I think everything is really important, perspective is like, instead of I have to do, I get to do it, and so... Like it's a privilege. I think edu education is a privilege, especially higher education and um, the job that I'm in. Like it's, I'm, I'm definitely privileged and humble, and that's my the part that I the keeps it grounded. Um, and so it's and, and so I think that people say, like, oh my gosh, I have to like do the um, like you know just enjoy it while it's stressful, while it's trauma. Yes, but like I, I enjoy it, but I'm also an outlier probably. But I've also been really blessed, like. I made I made it the dean's list, you know, top twenty percent of my class. I secured a j good job, and I'm working for the Illinois Supreme Court next semester. So like, I've been really blessed. So like, things are working in my favor. So it's kind of easy to say that than be on the other side. Mm -hmm. so. I want to talk about uh, you know we've talked about the stigmas associated with different identities of people, right? Yeah. And obviously, you come with your own identity as mm -hmm. somebody who is, you know, somebody who requires certain levels of accessibility and is in a wheelchair. And I want to just better understand, like, how can the average person be more supportive, not just physically accommodating, right, and mm -hmm. offering, you know, to do certain things in that regard, but, mm -hmm. like, how can people consciously be better people for your own mental health as you think about, like, the stigmas and maybe the ways that people have treated you differently because mm -hmm. of your circumstances? And what are those stigmas, and then how can we be better about that? Good question. Um, some stigmas, I guess, is, like, all the same people are the same. So then it's, like, uh, so, like, and so the privileges that go with, like, I'm technically more able-bodied than other folks. So, uh someone else who might be in a wheelchair might, might not have been able to do the stairs that going down so like uh you know just asking what like what can they like what are your limitations mm -hmm. instead of assuming that all wheelchair oh, like like okay so for example all wheelchair people might be the same it's not because some might be spinal cord some might be other things and so uh, just like what are your limitations instead of assuming their limitations for mm -hmm. themselves uh, but also just feeling. No. I was gonna say. I was gonna say. This would have been good to know about 24 hours ago. Okay. Like I, I don't take offense. I don't take offense to it. Like it's just. I think in general, like if people don't know, like it's a great learning opportunity. But then you know, other people are like it's not my job to teach. Well, if no one teaches, then no one knows. So, like I don't. I I think it's a good learning opportunity. But also just feeling included, right? It's like uh, I don't know. Like it, like. 
the ones that like unintentional not like let me run to get the door now i don't know how to hold the door and you're now you're kind of in my way because you're holding the door but in the way but like <laughs> like i'm like that didn't even help i could just open my door myself uh at that point but more like oh if we go to a bar then like everything's like really high up right again but that goes to what your limitations are so i can just hop on the seat but some people they can so now everyone is like sitting here and then you're just sitting here so like intentionally like oh if we just all continue so happen to sit at a table maybe you thought about it but you don't want them to make them feel like oh i thought that about this for you you just make them feel included like naturally right instead of like i'm singling you out and like because i like i went to dc for this thing and we had a, a bus and like i was able to do the stairs but this other girl couldn't so she's like don't worry i got you a, a separate car but now she's not with the whole group so now it kind of feels like while you were trying to be like, now you kind of singled her out. So there's kind of like a needle threat, not a needle threat, but there's like a, there's a line between um, wanting to, or not wanting, but like being included and yeah. accommodated for, but also not feeling like you're a burden, burden. or singled yeah. out, right? Mm-hmm. And like, how have you had to, you know, maybe show grace at times mm-hmm. and like be patient with people who, like me and Matt, yeah. right? Like we don't know enough, like yeah. we don't have enough interactions. Mm-hmm in that regard and so like moment of vulnerability like we need to learn how to best like accommodate but don't make it seem like we're singling you out yeah, right yeah. don't add to that kind of burden um i guess you just like asking again like, communicate right yeah, yeah, the, education yeah the, what, what they prefer like for example some disabled people don't like the word inspiration and all this and versus others so, like everyone has a preference because like some have just some are able-bodied and then became injured Versus me, like, this is all I've known my whole life, right? And so, like, to be an inspiration, because I'm getting bread at a grocery store. Versus, like, okay, maybe, like, winning an accolade, maybe, but, like, I'm an inspiration because I'm going to the grocery store, like, kind of different. So, but, like, also people's preferences, right? Like, you know, some people might be, if they're a veteran or a wounded veteran, right? Like, that might be an inspiration because, like, you, you know, you survived something very tragic, and so... It depends on what, again, that was just one example, but like kind of a preference. And I don't, I don't expect people to be 100% right all the time. Like I, but also like, I don't, I think over in the disabled community is, I don't think we, we're not really like, I can't believe they asked if I needed help. Like, you know, I appreciate it. Yeah, there's, there's like this middle ground because when you show up to the gym and you're working out, it's like that's you it's like I'm just doing something normal and I want to be feel you know be normal I want to acclimate myself with normalcy right but when I go to the gym and I see somebody who you know has no legs and they're working out in the gym I'll think like well if they can get up in the morning and do it but like that's not your thought process you're like no we're both people yeah and like I can do this this Mm -hmm. is not novelty this is not you know deserving of an award of any kind but for somebody like me who sees that it's like okay well then i don't have any excuses right it's like look at them i'm inspired how do we meet in the middle there but no i think i i sometimes you don't realize the impact you have on folks yeah and so i i realized that and so i don't Mm. it's not like i don't want to like like you know if me getting up and you know because every day is about i know folks like don't even want to get out of bed and so, like, just me- the mental wise, and so that that's a win for you, right? And so, uh, but then I, I, you know, I get worried, like, because I see myself, like, oh, like putting value, like I have to do this, do this again. If you don't, if you if you do one achievement, and like that is your win of the day, you know, like give you. I don't think we recognize, like, I think it's go 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 that we never reflect and be like, I. You know, it might be a small accomplishment for yourself, but you did that, and so. That's I don't want I don't want people to like oh like I have to do it because she's doing it but like if I inspire folks okay like motivate yes but I don't want them to get lost and be like I need to do this because if not I'm like a failure and all this I don't want a balance of that yeah I, I well I because like I, I to be frank like I was in, when I saw you yeah but was even like the step further was just like how uh, bright and like how happy or what I perceived as like just um just a a bright light you were Mm -hmm. in the gym and I'm like wow like that's why I wanted to have you on the show because I'm like you you must just have such a great perspective on life more generally Mm -hmm. 
And then I found out, and that's all I knew about you was that, you know, you were in a wheelchair. And mm -hmm. then I found out that you'd come from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and, it was a, and I'm like, she's going to be able to shed just such a unique. a unique and beautiful perspective on life more generally. Um, and then like, when you get, I, something came up that I had a question on. Um, you mentioned like others that maybe were able-bodied and then like lost mm -hmm. a limb or mm -hmm. something. In your experience, like how have you seen that affect me their mental health relative uh, to maybe someone that like yourself that just mm -hmm. this is just what you've known? Yeah. So my my I was the junior team I was I was on it used to be rehab uh, rehabilitation institute in Chicago now it's Shirley Rehabilitation Lab, and half of my team were uh, gun gunshots and so like. These eight-year-olds, you know, like you know, just playing in the park, and then you know, and now, now the whole life is gone. Well, in the eyes at that time, right? Like the life that you knew is gone. And like to be honest, yes, like you can't have expectation. Like I'm gonna live the same exact life, because to be honest, that's not. But I think I when I meet people who are like newly injured, like within a month or so. Um, Finding commonalities, like bringing bringing out the competitiveness, right? Because I think that's what made me fall in love with sports, right? It's so like uh, people love racing, right? In the wheelchair, just like oh, you know, like and just like joking around, make them feel as normal. Because I think their family sometimes is like, ah, like this is you know, I you know, it's all new, so I understand that. But like making them feel normal, make them feel as equal, and then so then it kind of gets them hooked on the sport, and then. Uh, telling them about you know having them make it feel community we joke about you know we still roast each other and stuff like that make them feel a little normalcy into it of a new life I think that's what helps them and do you have like any particular people that are kind of like uh, resistant to the idea of like this is like reality like no I don't want to be a part of this community because like I don't want to yeah. accept that this is so I mean and some people believe that I'm gonna be able to walk again and so I mean, it, it does happen sometimes, right? To each his own, but like again, not basing success on I'm a successful if I walk, right? Mm. Is because like that's very hard because like you can have a partial spinal fracture, uh, but not if a complete one, obviously not. But a partial one, maybe you can rehabilitate and help walk, right? And that's a great goal to have to you know physical therapy and be mobile. That's great, important to you know get your limbs moving, but to not base that it like. That, like you can't that. tie yeah. your entire yes. happiness or like yes. receive a success yeah. on and, that. And then why stop? Why stop what you're doing now, right? And making friends, making and enjoying the process. Community. Exactly, yeah. it's a journey, definitely. And I think, but it's that's very hard to say to tell folks. So it's like, so instead, of like, I try not talk about the injury and make them feel like we talk about sports or something that makes them like feel normal. And if they want to bring it up, then we start talking about it because you know, be like, I hate what I think people like. Eric when was like, hey man, like, you know, like, well, what'd you get injured for? Why, why would you ask him that? <laughs> like, you know, he just got out two months ago. Like, don't ask him that. And, you know, if he wants to bring it up, like, you know. Um. It's so interesting because we've always talked about how people's problems are relative, but you have such an empathetic perspective that people's successes and accomplishments mm -hmm. are also relative. For some people, success, winning, is just getting out of bed, mm -hmm. is an example you had mentioned, yes. right? And I'm just so curious, like, how you talked about, well, don't tie, like, don't don't all of a sudden make walking your North Star, or, like, mm -hmm. your sole purpose, perhaps, yes. right? Yes. And, like, maybe people can fall into that type of mentality. Mm -hmm. So, question for you is, like, what does success look like in your life going forward from mm -hmm. this moment? Maybe it's success, maybe it's purpose, maybe it's mm -hmm. kind of hand in hand. I'm just curious, like, how you think about your purpose or what you're driving yeah. towards in life. Yeah, I mean, yeah so... Uh, growing up, I said my biggest goal was to meet my biological parents, and so now my biggest goal in life, like I'm not really afraid of death, like I'm a adrenaline junkie, I love that. I really, my biggest fear is like not making an impact, a positive one, because you can make a negative impact, a positive impact. It could be one individual or whatever, that is my goal and purpose I think in life. And how that looks and what I do, I just want to make a positive impact. Um, and so. And so obviously I have tangible actual things, like my goal obviously is to graduate, pass the bar. My goal is also to potentially play overseas. Um, my goal also professionally is to make sure my family is financially stable, pay, pay their house. Uh, that's my biggest like personal like goal. And then also making the 2028 Olympics. Uh, but after that, like again, after all that sports and all this like, you know, 
profession wise, right? My my ultimate like profession goal is to make policy. So I'm interested in policy making and like again, that makes an impact, right? And like just making sure that those policies that impact people who are passing laws or, you know, statutes, uh have never been in the communities that that it's affecting. So I just want to make sure the laws that are getting passed are, you know, geared toward everyone and like, you know, and so that's my end goal is policy making because that's how you're going to have an impact on the community. A lasting one at that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say you, again, you probably don't care nor want to hear this, but you just living the life that you're living is serving a positive impact on a lot of people. That you I probably, I don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah, that, that, but it, it's just a reality. Yeah. Like seeing, seeing you smiling for an hour the entire time you're at the gym and just like, like it, it, it inspired me. Yeah. So, it, and so if it inspires me, I know it's inspiring mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of other people. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything else you want to ask before we go into the rapid fire? No, no. Rapid right. fire. Rapid fire questions <laughs> coming. There's only three, so we're, oh, okay. it's not a marathon. Okay, okay. Uh, they're fun. <laughs> kind of deep and fun. Uh, the first one is, do you have, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given or just like a favorite quote? Ooh. And it has to be rapid fire? You have to think about it. I, I no, mean, you, no, can, no. You, you can think about <laughs> okay, it. Okay. Yeah, you don't have one. Um, biggest, okay. Um, well. You mentioned one about the book. Uh huh. I don't remember what it was. Oh, the things you can only slow down when you. The things you can see, see when, when you slow, slow down. down. Yeah. Has Hack said anything recently? Huh? Hack, has he said anything recently? Man, <laughs> that man. He <laughs> <laughs> trying to give me five a.m. workout, and I texted him. I said, "You must have. You must have said, give me a typo." I was like, "That must have been a typo." He's like, "No." Um, but yeah, I think my dad. Oh yeah. Okay, so I think I said it earlier, but like. Um, Oh, my favorite is, uh, one of my favorites is uh, that all problems, all, all problems are a mile high, mile wide, but only paper thin. Hmm. Mm. I haven't got that one. I got to think about that one to truly appreciate it. Can you elaborate on what that means? So like in your perspective, like your, the problem or your things that you're battling or facing, right? They seem a mile high. So like, I don't even know how I'm going to get through it. But in I'm reality, it's... A mile wide too. Like, I don't even know how I'm going to move side to side. But in reality, it's a paper thing. Oh, so you can go through it. Yes. Got yes. it. I think, I think I got it. I, I got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get it. Get it, you know? Um... You, you do that. <laughs> uh, I'll, be, I'll be here. The, the next question. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Ooh. Dead or alive. Hmm. I think... I, I, I'm big in civil rights and voting rights and activists and stuff. And so I think uh, just to see... Well, he's still alive, but now he's he's facing dementia. But Reverend Jesse, Jesse Jackson, mm. I think that like uh, just to see you know, cause like I think what what was like working, you know, but also like continuing, but seeing how the he's still like live now. So like how has you you see what they have gone through and like accomplished in like the Civil Rights Act, but then seeing how now society is kind of moving backwards and what that perspective is like. I haven't got that answer before. Um, and lastly, just like hobbies, what do you like to do? I'm assuming sports, yeah, but like, what do you like to do in your free time? Um, I like to cook and I like to write poetry. Um, mm. And I, uh, I have a couple plants too. I want to. Get, my family has animals and dogs, but I was like, should I get a dog? I don't know. Do but, it. But I'm not a cat person. I'm sorry. I'm not. My sister has. But I'm like, no, I can't do it. But yeah, I, I like to write poetry and cook because living in a multicultural family, like I like to learn about, like. Like Mexican tradition, Polish traditions, and like all of the above. Well, thank you, Stella, for your time. We're gonna wrap up here, but just thank you for being open, for sharing your wisdom and your story. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>